For now, it's exactly a quarter to nine. At this time next week, we begin the 1991 Wreath Lectures. The lecturer is Dr. Steve Jones, reader in genetics at University College London, and he's called his lectures The Language of the Genes. To introduce the series, Steve Jones talks to Peter Evans about the background to the lectures. In the late 1950s, a bright 15-year-old boy happened to pick up a book on the subject of race. It struck a chord in the youngster. Indeed, the interest it awoke in the inborn differences and similarities between the animals of the world, including humans, was to persist into adult life and shape his whole career. He became a geneticist. He's now a reader in genetics at University College London. He's Dr. Steve Jones, and he's this year's Wreath Lecturer. Steve Jones, that 15-year-old boy, we know he liked fairly grown-up books. Tell us a bit more about him. Well, I think he was like most other 15-year-old boys, fairly obnoxious in retrospect. Um, my hobby, like many more biologists than would like to admit it, I think, was, was bird-watching in the most tedious sense, that is, ticking off the different species you could see. I was never particularly good at it, although I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I like making lists, doing taxonomy, that kind of thing. And from that, I became interested in biology and evolution, and look where we are now. <laughs> An academic family? Yes, to some extent. Uh, my father's a, a scientist. My mother's got a degree in... Uh, my father's a physicist. Um, she didn't call that a scientist. My mother's got a degree in bacteriology, so academic in that sense. Yes, certainly an academic family, so uh, quite a lot of inheritance of profession there. Well, I'm sure it's not genetic. Uh, and my background was one of tedious predictability, I would say. I went to a local primary school in Liverpool, a local grammar school, the University of Edinburgh, off to the States to do a postdoc at the University of Chicago and now at University College London. Uh, all slightly tainted by the left-wing liberal political taint, I'm afraid. It certainly wasn't Eton, Cambridge and the Guards. And I'm sorry to say I've been polluted by my past, and I, but I hope that doesn't show itself too much in the lecture. This left-wing taint, how far is that reinforced by the study of genetics? I think, to be honest with you, not at all. I don't feel that anything which I've discovered in... I haven't discovered much, anything I've read in genetics has altered my political views in any way, and I wouldn't expect that it would. People have invoked genetics, haven't they, to serve both sides of the political spectrum. Um, egalitarianism on the one side and enormous differences on the other. That's true. And that experience on both sides of the spectrum has shown what a big mistake it is to try and put a political slant on science or a scientific slant on politics. Well, everybody's well aware, of course, of the Hitlerian experiment in genetics, a terrible thing if you can call it an experiment which had a strong genetic component. He was advised by people who were human geneticists. He read the standard German text on human genetics. So that's a terrible indictment of a right-wing slant on genetics. You tend to forget, of course, that exactly the same thing happened in Russia. Because there was, it was regarded as so unforgivable to say that human attributes were inborn rather than they could be changed by society, genetics went through a terrible time. Many of the best Russian geneticists were shot. So that there's blame on both sides, and I like to think that at least in its purest research sense, science should be, as far as we can, value-free from that point of view. At about the time, you know, you were reading that first book, it was a, a great period of ferment in, in genetics, wasn't it? The double helix, Watson and Crick, and that kind of thing. Yes, that was, that was definitely B.C. before Crick, there's no question. Of course, at school, you were never really aware of this, and indeed, even at university, um, they didn't really let you into the secret until you'd been through the animal kingdom and dissected the dogfish and all those terrible things you used to have to do in biology. I was sort of told the prurient truth about genes and the like when I got to my third year at university, and that really struck me as the thing I'd like to work on. <laughs> What's the prurient truth about genes? The prurient truth about genes is that they're much more complicated than you ever thought. I mean, uh, when I started at university, or, actually, or maybe just before then, genetics as a subject was thought not to be suitable for students because it was too hard and too difficult. Um, and lots and lots of departments of genetics, including my own, which was the genetics department at Edinburgh, had not taught undergraduates before. That changed very, very quickly, and in fact now, as we know, I mean, genetics is seen to be so central to the whole of biology that many university courses actually start with it. It's a growth area, no question about it. I would say it's an explosion area. In some ways, to be a cynic, it seems to me, and maybe I'm being a bit too cynical, that the exciting days of genetics were, in fact, the 50s and 60s, when it was still a rather recondite and abstruse field which didn't have a lot of publicity or much money put into it. Since then, it's turned into high technology, which by definition, in some ways, is probably less original, even though it may be more spectacular. Let's move on to the Reef Lectures. It's a vast subject, genetics. Um, how have you tackled it in the lectures? 
Well, I've been driven back to analogy, the last refuge of the scoundrel in some ways, an analogy between the evolution of genes and the evolution of language. Now, genetics is, of course, now a gigantic subject. In some ways, it encompasses the whole of biology. There's almost nothing in biology which isn't now illuminated or illuminates genetics. One part of biology has always been particularly close to genetics, and that's evolution, because without genes, there could be no evolution. The two things are intimately related. So what I'm trying to talk about is the pattern of human evolution, how we differ from place to place, and the process whereby that pattern emerged, the mechanisms, mutation, natural selection, random change, and the like, which produce the differences among the peoples of the world. Oddly enough, it turns out that, at least on a superficial level, both the patterns of change and the processes of change in language are quite similar to those in genes. So I've learned a lot about language, and I've tried to use those analogies to illustrate the things that happen in our own biology. And uh, the thing about human genetics is, of course, it's got a lot of individual human stories in it, which are interesting stories. Um, I think I mention a lot, for example, which is interesting, is the way in which the royal family, British royal families and other royal families, simply because they have such long pedigrees, have, in fact, been very useful in genetics. So those kind of individual tales, I like to think, maybe illuminate the story. Let's have a look at this process of, of evolution, human evolution, and its relationship, or the metaphor that you use, of language. Now, people have talked about a proto-language, a single language from which all other languages are, might be derived. Are we to say the same thing about the human race? Yes, I would say certainly yes. And in fact, the logic of deciding that there was a proto-language is exactly the same kind of logic Darwin used of deciding that there must once have been a proto-human. The reason we think that there's a proto-language from which all others descended is exactly the same reason which Darwin used to think that there was a proto-human, that we were related to chimps, that mammals were related to mice, and that mammals and mice were related to coral, shall we say. That is, there's a, there's a set of decreasing similarities as we go further and further apart from, from ourselves in the living world, and as we go further and further away from English, we get from English to French, which are quite similar, from French to Turkish, which is different again, from Turkish to Chinese, which is wildly different. And by drawing trees and using a bit of ingenuity, you can, as you say, infer what the ancestral language was. In the last few months, people have actually, I believe, begun to guess at what some of the original words spoken maybe 100,000 years ago were. The one I remember is the word tick, which I read is the word for finger or toe. God knows how they know that. <laughs> Let's go back to the, uh, the genetic side, the proto-human being, the sort of Adam and Eve. People have been talking a lot about that, haven't they? The, the creation of, of humans probably somewhere in Africa and migrating out of there. Well, creation is a ticklish word, as you can guess when you're talking to an evolutionary biologist. We talk about the evolution of humans. Most people now agree that the first modern humans appeared in Africa around perhaps 150,000 years ago. Not everybody agrees that. In the lectures themselves, I rather slip over the fact that some paleontologists uh, disagree with it with great passion. There are plenty of people who work on fossils who suggest that humans come from Asia, or even that they emerged all over the world at the same time. But the consensus from genes and from fossils is that Africa was our home, and that we started there, as I say, 100,000 years and more ago. And of course, we spent most of our time, most of our evolutionary history was spent within Africa, so that in some sense, Africans are the most advanced members of the human species because they've been evolving in situ much longer than the rest of us. So how have you tackled the lectures? Have you looked at, the, looked at it as a great historical panorama, starting out from these proto-humans and, and radiating out, or how have you cut the cake? Not really. I've tried to use the process rather than the history. I mean, the way I started was to read hundreds and hundreds of stunningly boring papers in molecular biology um, and try to weave them into some coherent tale. Now, whether or not I've succeeded, of course, I don't know. I mean, that's depends on what the people who listen to them think. I found it really very interesting and very gratifying, actually, that by even reading papers that have come out in the last few months, there's a definite feeling that things are beginning to slot together, that observations in biology, in very different parts of biology, from animal behavior to paleontology to the details of DNA structure, are really beginning to fit together very nicely to make a coherent tale. Tell us a bit about your own research, um, which I think you described to me once as unremittingly trivial. <laughs> What's it on? Well, when I tell you that it's on what makes snails look different from place to place, you'll learn what I mean by trivial. One of my great pleasures has always been to be completely and utterly useless, at least in the point of view of research. And I would like to be able to claim that I've never invented anything or done anything useful to the economy at all. Unfortunately, 
what they tell you about the progress of science is right. You can't help finding out something valuable and something economically viable, even when you're wasting your time looking at snail genetics. You look at snails, and yet the Reith lectures are very much about ourselves, our genetic inheritance, where we came from. Well, I mean, the genetic message in snails is the same as it is in ours. It's the double helix, and the evolutionary processes which gave rise to snails, to sound rather pompous, but it is true, are exactly the same that gave rise as those that gave rise to humans. And you can do all kinds of interesting things with snails which you simply wouldn't be allowed to do with the human race. You know, we're talking about evolution, and the principles of evolution are the same for every creature. And if you read The Origin of Species, which is, by the way, a rattling good read, it's very easy to read, you find examples from all kinds of different creatures in it. And it's perhaps not widely realised that Darwin, who was, a, you know, who was a superb evolutionist, who founded the whole subject, was also the world's greatest expert on barnacles. And he wrote a great thick square book about barnacles, which he used to illustrate the theory of evolution later. So we can draw general rules from any animal we like and apply them to humans. I suppose in my mind is that it's usually the paleontologists, isn't it, the fossil hunters who claim to know the way the human species evolved and moved around. The evolution by jerks, as we sometimes call it, um, punctuated equilibrium. Yes, that's true. Uh, the problem with being a paleontologist, at least for humans, is that the general lesson to be learned from the human fossil record is that evolution took place somewhere else. I mean, you don't find many human fossils. If you look at the human literature on human fossils, again, though, you find they refer very extensively to literature on other primates and, oddly enough, on snails, which, of course, leave excellent fossils. What sort of things do you do with snails? And, indeed, how do you do it? Do you sit on a hillside and just watch them, or what? I tried that, but I fell asleep after about the first six hours. Well, we do, I've been working on snails for 20 years or more, so we do lots of different things. To return to my youth, if that's of any interest, a thing which I was always fascinated by was maps. And I always really used to spend hours and hours looking at road maps and deciding what the quickest way from Gangtok to Lhasa was and that kind of thing. And like many evolutionary biologists of 10 years ago even, all we really could do was to map out the genetics of a particular species, this particular species of snail, to draw maps of what genes were where. And I spent a long time doing that, both the genes you can see by looking at the shells and also writing some rather simple molecular biology. And those maps turned out to be quite interesting. Snail genes differ a lot from place to place. And the question then arose, why? It turns out to have a great deal to do with thermal relations in sunshine, how they behave when they're in the sun. So I've been looking at that using a variety of different methods since then. But you are one of those scientists who does field work. You do literally go out and do some observation. That must have some sort of tedious component to it, mustn't it? Well, all I can say about it is not half as tedious as being one of those scientists who, like most of the others, has become an administrator. Now that uh, you know, I've reached that stage in my career when my main scientific equipment is the telephone, um, I realised that being in the field for weeks on end was actually quite good fun. It can be extraordinarily dull. I mean... My field work, my tri field trips were trivial. I think the longest one I ever did was something like 14 weeks, which I spent in Yugoslavia many years ago. I recently reread The Naturalist on the River Amazon by Bates, which is a magnificent biological travel book. And his first field trip was 11 years long without a break. Um, and that, that I really do admire. <laughs> You know, it seems to me your kind of genetics is, is very old-fashioned. You go out and you look at snails and you look at their colouring and so on. Quite a bit different from the sort of high-tech sort of science that one sees in most biology labs nowadays. I think that's the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me about my research. I think it's, it, it's a great beauty in being out on a limb, you know. I mean, one of the people who aren't scientists maybe don't realise what a horrible cutthroat business it is. There's nothing more dis disappointing, and I've seen it happen to people, than to spend months or years working on the molecular biology of one particular gene. And then to find just by chance, with no, no funny work in the shrubbery, that somebody else in the States with ten times as much money has done it before you. So in the purely negative sense, there's something deeply comforting in being about the only snail geneticist in the world. So I recommend it from that point of view, if nothing else. Now, you're gratified that I describe you as an old-fashioned biologist looking at snails. Am I to take it that these snails are never subjected to, to high-tech analyses? Well, I guess my better judgment, I've been forced away from the single helix to the double helix. Um, that's a joke about snails, you know, snails having a single helix. Yes, I have, predictably, and my colleagues have, um, done a certain amount of rather simple molecular biology on snails. We've looked at patterns of genetic variation in their proteins from place to place. And we've done that, in fact, to establish the nature of the racial differences among snails. It does turn out that if you are a snail, it makes a lot of sense to be a racist, because snails from different places are racially quite distinct, unlike humans. We're beginning to move to look at DNA sequence in snails. That hasn't been very successful so far, but uh, we're grinding away at it. <laughs>
People who've read any of your papers, your letters and uh, news and views pieces in the journal Nature will know you are extraordinarily well read. Where does all this reading come from? How do you get time off from snails to get this reading done? Well, <laughs> a lot of it has to do with working on snails. I mean, if you're a field biologist of any kind, anybody who's done field biology will know that most of your time is actually spent waiting waiting for the weather to change or for something to come in the mail or to get a permit to take something across a border. And when you do that, what you do, you sit in your tent. In the evening, you tend to open bottles of wine and sit around talking about anything but science. Though for the rest of the time, you read. And that, of course, was what Victorian fiction was all about. It was for people to spend the hours when they didn't have a television set. And I've read vast quantities of Victorian fiction in the field and maybe a little bit even rubbed off. Genetics is a very contentious area, isn't it, Steve? It's impossible, really, to talk about genetics without thinking of some of the misuses of genetics, the so-called eugenics movement. Do you have any reflections on that, the sort of misuse, really, of, of a subject which should be illuminating but can actually be fairly destructive yeah. if used in the wrong way? It's certainly the case that genetics historically has a very, very grim past. Having said that, if, when I talk to my colleagues in the lab, when I'm not discussing about, you know, who's going to sit at what desk and how, why, why their room is the wrong size, people in modern genetics don't actually spend their time talking about the eugenics movement, about the ethical implications of their work. However, I think it's fair to say that everybody in the field is very well aware of what went on in the past, but they're generally ashamed of it, and they're very, very clear in their own minds that modern genetics is a subject completely divorced from the science which passed as genetics before the Second World War. But, uh, I mean, I suppose really what I, I'm implying is that genetics may teach us that we're all sort of brothers and sisters, basically. We're all in this great family, this interlinked family, that us and all the other animals on, on this planet. And yet genetics does also teach us that there are enormous individual differences, aren't there, between individuals? Some are more beautiful, some are faster, some are more clever. Do you need genetics to tell you that? I mean, we've always known that. Um, the fact that uh, there may possibly be some inherited to component to who's more or less clever seems to me only to gild the obvious. I mean, we know that to be... We, we've always known that there are differences among people. I don't think the fact that we sometimes now know that that's partially due to genetic differences among them need make any difference. I suppose people are kind of using g genetics to say, I, I told you so, if, if you can establish that there's some genetic basis for a particular uh, behaviour or attribute. It's kind of, you know, it's stamped in people and there's not much you can do to change it. It, it really rather goes against the sort of nurture school of thought, doesn't it? People who say that kind of thing are often people who have always wanted to blame the victim. You know, there's a strong theme that if you're born with something, it's your fault. There's nothing you can do about it. Of course, it isn't true at all. I mean, we're all born with particular attributes, but they're not our fault. What you tend to find is that there's a grotesquely oversimplified feeling, at least among, um, I hate to say it, among people on the right, that you can actually separate gene from environment as being totally different and dissectable entities. Well, they ain't. They're simply not. You can't do it. I could give you example after example of instances which appear on the surface to be genetic, to be stamped into somebody, which you can alter with the environment. We live in an age, don't we, of, as you've said, enormous change in, in the world of genetics, molecular genetics, genetic manipulation, the possibility that you may be able to tinker with somebody's uh, genes. Does that raise implications for moral responsibilities of scientists, do you think? And I have in mind scientists working on the bomb who say, we only work on the bomb, we don't decide who to drop it on. Do you think that geneticists are in the same kind of position as those scientists? I think there's an element of truth in what you say, for sure. I don't think that the threats from genetics are anything like those which came from working on the bomb. I remember reading a book, a most excellent scientific biography by Richard Feynman, who was a brilliant mathematician and physicist, who went to work when he was a young man on the Manhattan Project, um, worked on the bomb. And nowhere in the book does he really suggest that he had any moral problems with it, but he comes up with one phrase which really rather shocked me when I read it. I've forgotten the exact phraseology, but it was something like that the most liberating moment in his scientific career was when he realised he had no responsibility for what people did with his work. Now, so in other words, he could go ahead and work on the bomb, the hydrogen bomb, whatever he liked, and it didn't matter. I myself don't feel that. I don't think most of my colleagues do. But my own feeling is that science is science, and that what you do with it is not a scientific decision. That's a political or a moral decision. Can you really say that, though? Can you ever do anything that's completely sort of value-free or context-free? I would like to think so, but I don't know that I'm sure about it. I mean, one, one case which perhaps slightly illustrates what you're getting at is 
is the very vexed question which I go into in the lectures about the nature of the genetic differences, if any, among the races, the so-called races of humankind. Okay. Now, it was always thought by early geneticists, if you can call them that, that it was blindingly obvious that there were huge biological inborn differences between black people and white people. And that seemed startlingly obvious. And geneticists made a number of shocking statements as a result. The question then arises, okay, now that we've got the technology, which we certainly have, of establishing just how different are black people and white people, should we not work on that simply because we might find that black people and white people are utterly different in all their genes, and that would have all kinds of nasty moral and political implications? Well, I don't think we should. And in fact, of course, people didn't stop work on it. They carried on. They looked at the, they've looked at the racial differences, so-called, between different people. And it turns out that the differences between, on the average between blacks and whites are trivial compared to the differences between two people who are themselves black or two different white people. Now, that's very gratifying for those of us who are liberals, but I think we should still have done it, even if the result turned out to be that black people are utterly genetically different from white people. To me, we should still have done the work, and the information would have been interesting and valuable. Publish and be damned. Well, publish and hope you're not damned, I have to say. <laughs> We're talking negatively. Genetics has been a very positive force for good, and we've seen it in the last decade. It's had tremendous impacts on medical science. Do you touch on that in the lecture? Oddly enough, 20 years ago, when I read that famous war, when I read that famous book on um, human race you mentioned, we knew really almost nothing about human genetics. We knew quite a bit about fruit fly genetics, quite a lot about bacterial genetics, but a minute amount about the genetics of humans. Well, now, because of the importance of medical genetics, everything is turned upside down. We now know more about human genetics than we do, certainly, about fruit flies, and probably than we do about bacteria. So that if you were now to choose a species upon which to do genetics, you'd probably choose humans. And in that sense, I do talk about medical genetics because a lot of the discoveries made by clinical geneticists turn out to be very illuminating about patterns of human evolution, human change. For example? Well, for example, let's look at things like mutation, genetic change, genetic accidents. We all know that there are born every generation many children who carry abnormalities of one kind or another. They're obviously clinically very important, and they've become more so as we've controlled infectious disease. Genetic disease has become much more relatively important. Many more children die as a result. This means that people have begun to look at mutations in more detail. And it turns out that mutations, in fact, far from being simple one-step changes, are fantastically complicated things. People who we thought had the same genetic disease, in some cases, like haemophilia, shall we say, are usually have got different genetic diseases at the DNA level. And by following where those different mutations are found in different parts of the world, we can often trace people back to where they came from, to what their relatives are, were, and to the kinds of events that actually happened when the mutation took place. And all that comes out of some straight clinical research. It's interesting that you should be delivering the Reef Lectures on genetics in the context of the so-called Human Genome Project, this project to map all the genes, the 100,000 genes or whatever it is in, in human cells. Do you see that as a valuable kind of instrument or tool for doing your kind of genetics? I certainly do, but thank God I'm not doing it. <laughs> the book, when published, is going to be probably the most boring and certainly the most expensive book ever published. It's going to be, what is it? There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of analogies of what it can be like. It's, uh, it's so many copies of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I think it's 20 copies or, or 100 copies of the London phone book. Um, people are just beginning to produce now popular books about the Human Genome Project. I think in about 10 years there'll be enough of those when you put them all together, they'll all add up to be 3,000 million letters long. So it'll be an enormously long book, most of which, as far as we know, will be absolute babble. It'll just be letters making no sense. About one place in a thousand will make a little bit of sense. You'll have to work your way through until you get to a sentence which makes sense. So it's going to be very tedious, and it's going to be expensive. The estimate is that it's going to cost, at the moment, about a dollar per DNA base, at 3,000 million dollars to produce, which sounds a lot, but it's a lot less than putting men on the moon. It's a less than the space telescope, and it's a tiny proportion of the Trident nuclear missile program, for example. So your interest in genetics, as I understand it, is what you might call population genetics, the way populations evolve, move, the influences on them. Yes, certainly. It's, uh, it's, the, it's genes in populations. Why are different individuals different, rather than why is this particular gene working the way it does? And what are the, in the in, in human race, um, the modern human, what are the influences that... Um, influence the way genes and populations behave. Presumably, 
uh, you know, transport must have some impact. You can move genes around because you can move bodies around from country to country and so on and so forth. I mean, there's no question at all that the most important event in human evolution was the evolution of the bicycle because we're now at the phase where we're beginning to mix our genes together into a gigantic homogeneous soup. It'll take a long time. If you look back at what causes differences in human genes from place to place, it's overwhelmingly clearly history. We can actually see quite convincingly from archaeology the way that humans spread and you can see striking genetic trends across the world today which reflect those historical events, the transport of humans from our African cradle to the most distant point we reached at Tierra del Fuego, shall we say. A series of lectures on genetics must contain some controversial elements, I would have thought. Uh, yes, I, tr I haven't particularly tried to be controversial. Um, the area which I hope won't cause too much controversy, but it might, is, the, is my discussion of the nature of, of racial differences. Um, and I expect, I fear, I may get some letters in green ink. Uh, there may well be those. My own feeling about the interaction between models and genetics is they are, in fact, separate things. That one, you know, if one is, for example, in the case of racialism, if one is absolutely and utterly determined to despise one's fellow human beings, uh, whatever you say about genetics is going to make no difference. Uh, so whatever I say is not, I think, going to change anybody's mind. I don't think there's anybody in the racist world who now uses biological arguments for hating their fellow man. Um, maybe they do. If they do, they're mistaken, but I imagine they probably don't listen to the reef lectures. So the basic uh, genetic message about race is, is an egalitarian one, you're saying? I think it is, certainly, yes. On this theme of the uh, controversial nature of genetics, in, in the last lecture you're going to be looking at the future. A any sort of debating points there? I think inevitably, yes. I mean, we haven't really yet begun to experience the controversies which are bound to emerge from genetics. Um, and they're coming in all kinds of surprising ways already. There have been cases in the American courts of married couples who divorce, who sue each other to get custody of the frozen embryos, that kind of thing. There have been cases, again, in the American courts of doctors who have been sued because a couple have a genetically damaged child and they weren't advised of the chance of getting it. Uh, there's, a, a case, there's a paper a few weeks ago which was really, I found, quite surprising. Um, somebody had studied the incidence of one particular variant in the DNA in people who, are, who drank, like myself, and no doubt yourself, who became, but who, unlike ourselves, become alcoholics. And it turns out that there is a DNA variant, if you believe this work, which has pretty good at predicting whether or not you become an alcoholic if you drink. And that's common. It's in about th a third of the whole population. Now, we, can, we could test people quite easily. Should we do it? Shouldn't we do it? It's going to be a question we have to face really very soon. It's 1991. You're delivering the Reith lectures on genetics. Is it a timely point at which to deliver them? I think it is. I mean, I think five years ago it would have been more difficult because everything was in complete upheaval then. The upheaval, you know, all our beliefs about genes as being like peas, I mean, little units separate from each other, had been stirred up into a kind of pea soup that seemed to make no sense. I mean, genes were broken up into bits and they jumped around in the genome. Most of our DNA didn't seem to do anything. And everybody was in a terrible flap, which would have been hard to put across, I think. I like to think that that the pieces have been thrown in the air and the bits of the jigsaw puzzle have now fallen to make a new kind of pattern which is beginning to make sense. However, maybe in ten years, somebody else will kick the table and we'll be back to pea soup again. Peter Evans was in conversation with Dr. Steve Jones, the 1991 Reith lecturer.